Well, we were in the new members class this morning. We started early, about 9 o'clock. So we were in there, and I didn't get to shake everybody's hand. So I feel like, you know, I need to come out there and shake everybody's hand real quick. I don't think, Adam's like, bring it. <laughs> yeah, I don't think we have time for that, but make sure you shake my hand afterwards, okay? Otherwise, I'll be crushed. I'll be heartbroken. Even though I'm safe now. Whew, I was sweating that. I don't know how in the world we won, Jaleel. That does not make any sense. I figured we would both be at the bottom, down there with Adam. We knew you were going to be there. <laughs> well, this week, I'm excited because I actually get to preach the point of this passage. Because two weeks ago, now last week we talked about the meeting. So two weeks ago, we kind of covered this. And we had to waste about 45 minutes talking about something that this passage does not address. We talked about alcohol. And that doesn't have anything to do with this passage. It doesn't have anything to do with the point of this passage. So I'm excited today because we get to talk about the point of the passage. And that's the name of the game, isn't it? In other words, this passage doesn't mean anything to us today if we can't get to the point. Why was it there? And why does it apply to us today? So let's pray and then we're going to get into it. Dearly Father, Lord, I thank you for today. And I thank you just for loving us, for dying on the cross for us, and for not staying dead. Lord, that's what makes it worth following you. That's what makes it so much different than every other religion in the world. I thank you for the message that you have for us today. And I pray that you would just be with us as we open your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, I'm going to read the passage again. Even though Adam read it. I looked out, Adam, and Jaleel wasn't paying attention. <laughs> so the rest of you, even though you've memorized it, yeah, he was celebrating his victory, he says. So the rest of you can just... just Balance your checkbook or something as I read it again. But this one's just for you, Brother Julio. Okay. On the third day, chapter 2 in verse 1 of John. On the third day there was a wedding at Canaan in Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Now draw out some, or draw some out, and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it out. When the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water out knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and then, when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did, in, at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. Now, look back at verse 4 and I just want to caution you on verse 4. Verse 4 says, And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? Now that's not the kind of talk that I would, that I would recommend that you do at your house with your mom or with your spouse. Because either way, it's going to turn out badly for you. Trust me. <laughs> if you start any conversation, men, I'm just helping you out. Okay, this is free. This is not the point of the passage, by the way. This is just a benefit of being here today. If you start at any conversation with the word woman, in reference to your wife or your mom, you're going to pay. You're going to pay dearly. And you're going to pay for years. Because it's going to come up 
years and years later. Every time she needs it, she's going to pull that card out. You remember that time when you said woman? Right? Yeah. If you say it, listen, somebody, somebody here today is going to do it. You know? Because us guys, we're not always that smart. We, don't, we hear stuff like that, and we think, it won't happen to me. Somebody's going to go home and do it. And they're going to come back next week with a black eye. And we're all going to look at it and we're going to say, yeah, I know what you did. You were the guy. You were the one that he was talking about that said it, right? And he's going to give you this story. Oh, man, you ought to see the other three guys. You know? I was downtown and it was late. I was in an alley. Don't believe it. He said woman. He started out a sentence with woman. Don't do it. But Jesus says, woman, what does this have to do with me? Now, one more warning for you guys. Don't use the excuse that, well, Jesus did it. Because that will get you in trouble. Right? So be very, very careful. The, Jesus is not being disrespectful. You have to understand the culture of the first century. You have to understand what was going on and what he meant when he said, woman, what does this have to do with me? He was, it, it's meant as a disassociation. Now, I know that's a big word, so I'm going to say it again for, for Adam. Did, no, he's writing it down. I figured I already picked on you. It was his turn. Okay, so I'm done with you. I'm, I'm done picking on you. I'm not done with you. I'm just done picking on you today. That's not for all of time, because it'll come back. It's a disassociation. In other words, he's distancing himself relationship-wise from his mother, his earthly mother. In other words, Mary's authority is changing. And that's why it's said the way it is. Woman, what does this have to do with me? He's, he's, he's changing that authority. Now, no doubt, Mary is growing impatient. You see, uh, it's been a couple of years, but I watched this, this play or this musical at my daughter's school, and they sang that song, Mary, Did You Know? And it makes me think, did she? Of course she did. She's known for 30 years. She, she's known for more than 30 years, at least 30 years and, and 9 or 10 months, right? She's known for a while. And I think Mary is growing impatient. And Mary's thinking, it's time. It's time for you to be known publicly as who you are. I've known for over 30 years who you are. It's time for them. And Jesus says, no, 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 wait. He says, I will choose the time. But did Mary know? Watch this. Turn over in your Bibles to Luke. It'll be on the screen, but Luke is not far away. You can turn to the first chapter of Luke in verse 30. And let's just examine this and see if Mary knew who Jesus was. In Luke 1, verse 30, it starts out and he says, And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. So this is when Mary is being informed. Now let's just see. For you have found favor with God. And behold, in verse 31, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Now, the Bible is written with what's called progressive revelation. In other words, Adam doesn't know everything. Not this Adam, because he does know everything. I'm making up for picking on him now. In other words, Adam and Eve didn't know everything that you know today. Progressively, that gets revealed. So, Jesus, you know today, Jesus, when it's mentioned here, is talking about Jesus Christ. But they didn't necessarily know that. In other words, Jesus was a very common name for a Jewish person to be named. So, is this Jesus the Messiah? Is that who Mary was going to carry? Or was it just another Jesus? Because it was a common name. Let's read on. Verse 32. He will be great and will be called. Now look at this. And in my Bible, it's all in caps. 
the Son of the Most High. Now, why in the world would it be in capital letters? A proper name. The Son of the Most High, and who is that? Read on. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, David. Now, if they know Scripture, they know this is talking about Jesus, the Messiah. But let's read on. Verse 33. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Now that's pretty clear, isn't it? I think Mary knew. Skip down to verse 39 there in Luke 1. In those days, Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. Who's the baby? Who's the baby in Elizabeth's womb? John the Baptist. We've been talking about him for a few weeks, haven't we? The baby, John the Baptist, the forerunner, the voice in the wilderness that's supposed to prepare the way for the Lord, that baby knew what was going on. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me, that the mother of my Lord, capital L, should come to me. For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby, John the Baptist, in my womb, leaped for joy. Mary knew. It's clear in Scripture that Mary, the mother of Jesus, knew that she was going to bear the Son of God. Elizabeth knew, no doubt. John the Baptist knew, and he hadn't even been born yet. Now let's talk about abortion. That's not the point of the passage. And we're not going to go there. We don't have time for that today. But listen, if that unborn child knew God was in his presence, I'm just saying, we'll get to that another day. So I would imagine that Mary was ready for everyone else to know what she already knew. So she was pushing the issue, but God, Jesus here, is working on a divine timeline, not Mary's timeline. And that's why he said what he said. He said, woman, what does this have to do with me? For, by saying that, it's kind of like saying, what authority do you have over me? You see, her authority as his mother was changing, as it should, with him being the Son of God. He was disassociating her from that relationship, but with the following statement that I will choose the time to be glorified, that's like saying, I will choose the appropriate time. You don't have that authority over me. Only I do. I will choose that time. So he wasn't being disrespectful. If you use that at home, just be careful. Because I would not imagine that you're going to use it in the way that Jesus was using it, because I don't think you're the Son of God. I've met most of you guys, and I don't think any of you would fill that bill. Anybody think they do? No, I didn't think so. <laughs> Look at verse 6. Now, there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification. They weren't even there for drinking, were they? They were there for cleaning, for purifying, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Now, if you have a King James Version in front of you, it'll say containing two or three firkins apiece. Now, firkin is approximately nine gallons. So when you do the math, you're going to come up with a range of between 20 and 30 gallons in that area. And that's what we're talking about here. 
is 20 or 30 gallons of water. But look what Jesus tells them to do with these jugs. In verse 7, Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars. Now that's a small word, fill. But it has great meaning, especially when you get to the end of the verse, the last word in the verse. He says, fill the jars with the water, and they filled them to the brim. Now if you remember right, from two weeks ago, they always <coughs> mixed wine with water. Always. They never did not, and you were a heathen if you didn't, right? We talked about that, that the, the, the normal mix ratio would be seven to one. Seven parts water to one part wine. And then we talked about the alcohol content and what that was comparing it to today. But Jesus here says to fill them, and they filled them to the brim. Why in the world would he fill them all the way if he needed to put something else in there? I think Jesus was being clean. I think he wanted to leave no room for anything else. He wanted there to be no room in the jars. He wanted there to be no room in their minds that anything had been added. He wanted there to be no question at all about what was about to happen when he made the water into wine. But why? He must have had a purpose, right? Look at verse 9. When the master of the feast tasted the water, had now become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants knew, who drew, drew out the water, they knew, the master of the feast called to the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. Who's he talking to? The bridegroom. The master of the feast went to the bridegroom and says, look what you did. There were a whole lot of people that knew who did what, weren't they? And they didn't tell, did they? The servants that poured the water, they didn't tell. They didn't straighten out the master of the feast. They didn't straighten out the bridegroom. They didn't tell who did what. Mary didn't tell even though she knew that Jesus did it. His brothers, Jesus' brothers were there. They didn't tell. The disciples were there. They didn't tell. And not even Jesus told. Who did it? And clearly he knew what was going on. I think because it's not about the wine. You see, we have to get to the point of the passage. It's not about the physical, and you're going to find that all the way through John as we go through, that Jesus keeps talking about spiritual matters, and they misunderstand them for physical. I think this is just another case of them misunderstanding spiritual matters, what Jesus was actually doing for the physical of what he did. In other words, their focus was on the wrong thing. I don't think this was about the wedding party at all. It's not about those people running out of wine. It's not about any of that. That leads us to the point of the passage. Now, two weeks ago, when Adam read this passage to you, this is the only verse that he read. Today, he read the entire passage, didn't he? There's a reason why this is the only verse he read two weeks ago, because it is where we find the point of the passage. It's not in the wine. It's in verse 11. Watch this. It says this, the first of his signs Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. Now there's a few things I want you to notice about this verse in particular. First, it uses the word signs. If you have a King James in front of you, it probably says, it, it does, it says miracles. If you have a new King James, it says signs. Almost all of the major uh, modern versions now say signs. There's a reason for that. You say, well, doesn't, doesn't sign, can't that be misunderstood? Wouldn't miracle be a better word there? Or would sign be a better word there? You see, we use sign for different, for different things, don't we? You see them on the road all the time. This morning, 
I had to divert off of I-20 because everything was closed. If you go under I-45 right now, at the wrong time, the entire interstate is closed, and we had to divert and go all the way up to what ended up 30 and come in that way. I had to follow signs. So we use signs in that way as direction, don't we? We use signs as ownership. That sign says that's my parking place. I don't have a parking place, but if you had a sign on it, right? It would, it would designate ownership. That's yours. That's the one. That's, that's where you go. But we even use sign to tell people they're stupid. Don't. You know that guy, right? Don't, don't nudge her, Adam. Leave free alone. Wait, wait. Here's your sign. You remember that guy? So we even use signs like that to say, you're stupid. Right? In other words, sign could be misinterpreted as, a, as many different things. So you said, well, maybe we should use miracle instead of sign. Now listen, don't misunderstand me. Don't, don't, don't take this as I'm down on the King James Version of the Bible. I still quote the King James Version. When I memorize, I memorize out of the King James Version because it's written in a flow that's more poetic, which is the time, the, 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 the vernacular of the time, in other words. So for me, it's easier for me to quote the King James than it is for, for me to quote another version. So I'm not telling you that your King James Bible is not a good Bible. It is. It's a literal translation, and you can trust it. And we're going to talk more about that as we go through the book of John. So I'm not saying that in this instance, it's a bad version. I'm just saying sometimes when men translate scripture, they don't always get all of the meaning into English. We learned about that two weeks ago, didn't we? When we talked about just the fact that wine today does not mean what it used to mean a long time ago. The alcohol content is not even close. We learned that most of you guys are NyQuilaholics. <laughs> we learned a lot a couple weeks ago, didn't we? The alcohol content of NyQuil is 10%. That's insane. That's why it hurts. That's why it tastes like medicine going down. It's nasty. But listen, I, don't, I think sign is the right word here. You see, watch this. Miracle, people say, well, that can't be misunderstood. And I think they have an argument, but not here. In other words, I believe in miracles. But here, the point doesn't lead us to the miracle. The point leads us to the miracle worker. So sign is the perfect word here, as opposed to miracle. In other words, miracle puts the focus on wine. It puts the focus on what Jesus did physically instead of who he is, who he was. That's why we wasted like 45 minutes two weeks ago talking about something that this passage does not address because we got distracted by what was going on there. We need to look at what he was doing. Now look at this. The, the Greek word here is semion, and it'll be on your screen for you. The description of this in the Greek, Greek lexicon says an event. This is why I say sign works better here. An event that is an indication or confirmation of intervention by transcendent, transcendent powers. A miracle of divine origin performed by God himself, by Christ, or by men of God. In other words, sign, by using the word sign, we're indicating or confirming that this was an event that had something to do with God himself. When we use the word miracle, we lose 
the tie. We lose the link to God. And we lose that in the translation there. Sign goes deeper than just miracle here because miracle focuses on the physical. The sign takes us to the performer, not the performance. So let's just see what Jesus is doing here. Look at verse 11. The first phrase there says, this, the first of his signs, we're going to actually study seven signs that Jesus is who he says he is, that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is the Son of God. John includes seven such signs, and we'll get through all of those in due time. This is the first one. It says Jesus did at Cana in Galilee, and what did he do by doing the sign? He manifested his glory. So he purposed to reveal his glory. That was the purpose of this sign. Turning the water into wine, the purpose that he did it for was to reveal his glory. So, with that in mind, how in the world would Jesus making alcohol fit into that purpose? It doesn't. And if it doesn't fit into the purpose, then it's rubbish. It doesn't mean that. So we can't go to this passage and we can't use it as an excuse to do what we already think is probably not right. On the road this morning, we were talking about it this morning in our uh, new members class. I saw a sign. It was, alcohol, it, it was advertising some sort of alcohol and I can't remember exactly what it was. But it said uh, it was some sort of liquor. So hard liquor. And it said, sinfully smooth, something or other. Sinfully smooth. Now that got me thinking. I was like, are you kidding me? They're not just condoning it. They're, they're, they're advertising it as if it's a great thing. In other words, man, this ain't just smooth. You see them people drink on TV? They'll take drink, whew, smooth. What does that mean? <laughs> Nothing like that, no. Banana pudding goes down smooth. <laughs> Alcohol, oh no, NyQuil don't even go down smooth. It hurts the whole way, right? Sinfully smooth. They're not just condoning it, they're telling you that it's okay. That listen, if you're doing it, hey, you're in the boat with all of us. We're all doing it, we're all bad guys, right? Don't the bad boys get all the attention in school? That's what they're saying, they're saying, we know it's sinful. Listen, Scripture teaches that you can only put your finger in God's face for so long before He takes care of business. He is merciful. He is gracious. He gives us grace upon grace upon grace. And, and when, when we would squash our neighbor like a bug, Jesus says, no, I got a plan for him. I got a plan for her. I'm going to show grace. But there's a point. When Jesus says enough. And he turns you over to the desires of the flesh. And he deals with you in a way that you don't want to be dealt with. Listen, I've had a lot of spankings growing up. And that's why I am the way I am. Crazy. No, we won't talk about all the adjectives of what I am today. But listen. I know what it takes to be corrected and I know what it took for me to put me on the right path and listen I would rather get a spanking from my dad any day over my mom my mom had these long nails they'd stick out like this and I'm thinking that should you should have to have an open carry license for those <laughs> right because they're not concealed they're right there and when she got a hold of you Oh my goodness, she'd get a hold of you under the arm right here, and she don't know what them weapons are doing. Man, they're digging in, and you don't dare move. You don't pull back. You just stand there and flop around because you don't want to cause more harm, right? And then after she done, you know, marked you, then she give you a spanking. And she just spanked till she get tired. I'm like, no, I've got to have daddy. Daddy gets it over with, and it's done, and I'm alone. Listen, 
I don't want that kind of correction from God himself. I would rather have my mom or my dad over my mom, but when it all comes down to it, I'd rather have either one of them over being corrected and getting a spanking from God Almighty. Because there's a point where he says enough is enough. You can put it on a billboard sinfully smooth and think it's okay all you want, but God says there's a time when I'm going to judge sin. And you won't be able to make an excuse. You won't be able to stand with your friends and say, yeah, but we're all doing it. Everybody has sex before marriage. No, they don't. Everybody drinks. No, that's a lie. Everybody does this. Everybody lives together before they get married. That's incorrect. And that's not scripture. And Jesus says there will be a time where I will stop it all. And it will all end for all of eternity. I don't want that kind of spanking from God himself. You might be able to use the excuse, well, everybody in our culture does it. But God won't listen to that excuse one day. The point of the passage is his glory. Doesn't have anything to do with wine. It's not the miracle, but the miracle worker. Look at the end of verse 4. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? He says, my hour has not yet come. What <clears throat> hour is he talking about? He's talking about the hour to be glorified. In other words, verse, verse uh, 11 is the rest of the story from verse 4. Verse 4, Jesus says, my hour hasn't yet come. And verse 11 says, it's here. That's the rest of the story. Some of you grew up with Paul Harvey. And you know how he ended every one of his shows. And now you know the rest of the story. In fact, I learned just this week that that was the name of the program too. The rest of the story. I didn't know that. I just knew his tagline. And now you know the rest of the story. And his presentation of it was everything too, wasn't it? So you remembered it. But verse 11 is the rest of the story to verse 4. Jesus says, okay, it's time. It's time for my glory to be revealed. Mary had waited over 30 years, and now she's witnessing the time has come. It was time for Jesus to become known as the Messiah. And how in the world does that have anything to do with alcohol? It doesn't. That's not how he marked his, his coming on the scene as public ministry. It was a sign. It wasn't just a miracle. It was a sign of who he was. Now look at the next part. The last part in verse 11. It says, and his disciples believe. There's the result. In other words, he says, my purpose is by doing this sign, by turning the water into wine, my purpose is that I be glorified, that I enter into my public ministry, and there should be a result for that. And what is the result? The disciples believe. It doesn't say they got drunk. It doesn't say they drank their problems away. It doesn't say they even drank socially, does it? It says they, it doesn't even say that how impressed they were with the miracle. It says they believed. They didn't just say, wow, this is good wine. What in the world? Man, I'm going to follow this guy because he can give us something good to drink. No, it says they believed. His purpose to was to reveal his glory, and the result of that was that the disciples believed in him. That was the result. He was not looking to be the life of the party. He wasn't the one that showed up with a couple of cakes. That person walks in the front door, don't they? That person walks in the front door carrying it. Hey, look what I brought to the party. Jesus didn't tell who made the wine. So how could that be his purpose? 
If he wanted it to be known to you today that you could drink socially or however it is that you want to define it, if that's what he wanted you to know, then he would identify himself as the winemaker. But he's not. He's trying to identify himself here as the Messiah. Not the winemaker. Not the physical. He's talking about a spiritual thing. And he did this for the disciples. He didn't do it for the wedding party. It wasn't for them. He didn't do it for the bridegroom. He didn't do it for the bride. He didn't do it for the master of the feast. He didn't do it for the servants. He did it for the disciples. Because that's where we see the result of his purpose. To reveal his glory. And what the disciples did, we do. We believe based on their belief. Based on what they saw. Not blind faith. In other words, Jesus didn't call them to a blind faith, did he? He called them, and then he spent the next three years pouring into them examples and proof of who he was and what he was doing. He says, I don't want you to just blindly believe. I want you to believe based on evidence. That's what John is doing with his gospel. Next week, we're going to talk about Exhibit A. First piece of evidence brought in as an exhibit. Here we find the first sign. We're also going to find some other stuff as we go along. But exhibit A will be next week. So he doesn't invite them into a blind faith. Now watch this. Dave Sterrick wrote a book called Why Trust Jesus. The quote will be on your screen for you. It says, Many Christians, he writes, mistakenly believe that Jesus called his disciples to a blind faith or to a leap of faith. Truthfully, he called them to a trust based on fact, based on evidence and reason. He goes on, this doesn't mean that God reveals all the answers immediately. Jesus called his disciples first and then spent three years with them living out a life that they could observe and trust. He didn't expect them to blindly believe. He says, I want you to believe based on faith. Based on evidence. Listen, you dads, when you got your little girl or your little boy and you put them up on top of something, like a table or something, you, you, you reach back and you say, jump. Is that blind faith? I say no. They trust you. They already trust you. They look at you, they say, you're my dad. You're my mom. You wouldn't do anything that would hurt me. I'm just not crazy about jumping. <laughs> so they have faith, but they don't have blind faith. Because if it was blind faith, they'd just jump. But how many of you have to coax them into jumping? Exactly. And you get, I will catch you. Trust me. I'm here. I'm not going to leave. I'm right here. Just jump. I'll catch you. They trust you. That's not blind faith. And Jesus doesn't invite his disciples to believe in blind faith no more than he invites us into blind faith. We, we see it today and sometimes we tell the, the, the good news of the gospel and we just expect people to blindly follow why? Why do we expect them to blindly follow when there's so much evidence? We're going to talk about so much evidence in the book of John. Just wait and see. It's going to be incredible. If you can lay that out for somebody, listen, there's no way that they won't believe. Because there's going to be so much evidence. There's going to be overwhelming evidence that Jesus is the Messiah, that he's the Son of God. And by believing in that, in him, you can have eternal life. That means everything. Jesus doesn't expect you to believe based on blind faith either. We shouldn't need a miracle today to believe. You see, in Bible times, a miracle could have been attributed to anybody. And that's why I love, in this instance, the translation sign. Because with signs, I get the link to God. 
Not just somebody performing a magic trick. We shouldn't need a miracle today. You're, you're driving down the road and you say, well, Lord, I don't know if you want me to talk to my new neighbor about coming to church or about Jesus. I don't know if that's your will. Really? And then you start negotiating with God. You say, well, Lord, I'll tell you what. If you will make the next three lights green, <laughs> then I'll see that that's your will. Right? We don't need a miracle like that to know what God's will is. God's will is already clear on all of that, on that subject for sure, isn't it? The Great Commission. Go. Make disciples. We don't need a miracle. We should be more focused on the miracle worker. Not the miracles. Dave Sterrett, another quote from his book, Why Trust Jesus. He says, in the Bible... Miracles were supposed to be rare events. When Jesus performed miracles, it was a sign that he was the Messiah. Listen, eventually, we're going to get to Jesus calling Lazarus out of the grave. He didn't do that for Lazarus. He did it as a sign of who he was. He has a purpose for that. Miracles, Dave goes on to write, were an indication that he, Jesus, possessed the power and the blessing of God the Father. And in John, we're going to study seven such miracles or signs of who he is. And that fits directly into the purpose of the book of John, doesn't it? John writes to prove that Jesus is the Messiah, that he's the Son of God, and that through believing in him, we can have life. Miracles don't fit into that purpose. But signs do. Jesus isn't asking you to believe blindly. Jesus made water into wine as a sign that he possessed the power and blessing of God the Father. Just like Dave wrote in his book. He's inviting his disciples in this passage to believe based on evidence. And that's what he does to us today. He's asking you to believe based on evidence. He's not asking you to blindly put your faith. In a few weeks, I'm going to preach a sermon on faith. And I'm going to tell you that I don't believe that blind faith exists. And I'm going to challenge you to bring me an example of blind faith. That's not what Jesus is inviting his disciples to hear, and it's not what he's inviting us to today. Now listen, we're going to enter into a time of invitation. I'm going to ask Phil to come, and they're going to play some music. Listen, Jesus is calling you today to trust in him for your salvation. To trust in him, not blindly, but based on the evidence of Scripture. That he is who he says he is. He's inviting you to trust him for your protection. To trust you or trust him for your health. For your family. For your relationships. He's inviting you to trust him for all of that. And you should not follow blindly. You should look at the evidence that will become overwhelming as you read the book of John. And trust in him based on that evidence. Sometimes it takes a miracle to get our attention. But I submit to you today that it should only take the miracle worker to bring you to the point that you see your need for salvation. You say, well, I don't know who this Jesus is. Guess what? I will meet you right down front in just a minute. And I'll take God's word. And I'll show you in scripture the miracle work. You know what you, you want to know what the miracle is? That he loved us enough to come. To die on the cross for our sins. For my sins. Listen, I know how rotten I was. And I know how rotten some of you were. Because I've started getting your backstory. 
That's the miracle in all of this, is that he would reach down to us. Every other religion in the world. Last count I had was 6,500 other religions outside of Christianity. And every single one of those religions is based on works. It's based on man trying to reach up to God and get to God. But following Jesus, it's the only one where God himself is reaching down to us. Listen, that's the miracle. But let's focus on the miracle work today. If you don't know Jesus, you're not here by accident. You're not here just because your friend invited you. You're here because you have a divine appointment with God Almighty. Not with me, not with this church, but with Jesus. The same Jesus that we talked about this morning. You meet me right here and I'll show you in God's word how you can know that Jesus. Listen, if you don't have a church home, I know a good one. And you don't have to go far. You meet me right here and let's talk about it. You need to be baptized? Guess what? We got some water. We can schedule you, you for that. We can talk to you about that. And we can get you to take care of that. You meet me right here and let's talk about it. As you stand to your feet and we begin to sing, you do today what God would have you do today. I have decided.